John Sowens Museum in Lincoln's Inn Fields is a magical place. Filled with magnificent spaces and intricate architectural details, it's home to an extraordinary collection of paintings, sculptures and artefacts from all over the world. John Sowen was one of England's most visionary architects, responsible for many of London's most prominent Regency-era buildings. Before he died, Sowen left the house to the nation and stipulated that it must be kept exactly as it was at the time of his death in 1837. But subsequent curators did make substantial changes. Whole areas of the house were remodelled. Works of art and artefacts moved or disposed of. And Sowen's private apartments were turned into offices. In 2009, the museum started a massive restoration project dubbed Opening Up the Sowen, aimed at putting the museum back to exactly the state it was in when Sowen died. This series tells the story of that restoration. Filmed over a period of six years, it traces the research, the discoveries and the skills that made the transformation possible. Halfway up the museum's main staircase sits the Tivoli Recess. Originally a closet, Soen transformed it into an exquisite little space that he used as a showcase for contemporary sculpture, and which boasts a beautiful and intricate plaster ceiling. Originally the ceiling of the Tivoli recess, would have, when it was a closet, would have been quite plain. It just would have been lath and plaster and it would have been whitewashed. But when Soane Soane fits it out to be part of his museum, he puts a very special ceiling in it which has a very shallow dome which he designs for the space. And then he decorates it with ornaments. Um, so there's a plaster cast of Apollo in the middle of the ceiling and then sunburst rays. Um, radiating from his face and then around the, the edges of the shallow dome are a serpent um, attacking an eagle. But this wonderful ceiling was a casualty of the many changes that befell the museum since Soane's death. And so, as part of opening up the Soane, in 2012 work started on recreating the ceiling. What we're recreating really is a masterpiece. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm so grateful that the Sonar are giving me the opportunity to do it. Um, it really is a masterpiece because it's got so many layers to it. If you count the last, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, you've got seven layers. So it gives you some idea. I think, anyway. Working in the tiny, cramped recess, Neil England is partway through casting, trimming and fitting the individual pieces of the multi-layered sunburst effect. Okie dokie. This is the first level of three layers of, of sunbursts. Okay? Because these are so thin, the only thing you can actually use to make them with is... Um, cotton lint kind of stuff. A bit like your grandmother's curtains. That's it. Each plaster ray has to be carefully shaved and trimmed to within a millimetre of the size specified in the architect's drawings. Next, 
Neil makes a final check that the ray fits correctly. It's perfect. Now Neil is ready to stick the ray in place. The material we use is the same as they would have used in that time. We don't use cove adhesive. <laughs> we use lime and alpha plasters. Still the same stuff. This is probably one of the most complex stick-ups I've ever done because you've got no margin for error. You are one mil out and it shows on the um, on the next one in line. Okay, now I have to quickly brush, yeah. brush, brush. Sorry about this. I, That's all right. I'm controlled by the times I have. Does that line up? That's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Let's just hope it stays there. Well, we put it up. We've put it up the same way the originals would have been put up, so I'm pretty certain it'll stay there. What we have here are the elements that live in each of the corners of this extremely domey ceiling. This is the eagle that spreads its wings across each of the undersides of the sunbursts in the corners. Underneath this eagle gripped in his claws are two snakes, okay? These were carved by our sculptress Sarah Mayfield, who I think is extremely talented. The snake goes underneath there, and then the raffle leaf lives under there. Rather lovely, isn't it? And these exist, as I say, in each corner of the ceiling. Uh, these are made from casting plaster, which is where they would have been made originally, high alpha plaster. Um, We've actually used a slightly tougher plaster these days. We've actually cheated here a little bit, just simply because being done just in straight plasters really isn't hard enough. So we do use a slightly tougher plaster now. But in principle, it's exactly the same. The methodology is no different to the way it would have been done in Sir John Soane's time. When we started on this project with the architects and the builders, um, we suddenly found dimensions were wrong, uh, drawings suddenly didn't agree, but it's been quite a journey. I mean, just trying to figure out how the ceiling worked with the eagles and the uh, pieces that fit in the corners was horrendous. <laughs> but I, I can happily stand here right now and say to you in all honesty with my hand on my heart that everybody's done the very best they can to ensure that this recess goes back exactly as it was in Sohn's time. With the ceiling finished, restoration of the Tivoli recess could be completed. And today, the sculptures that Soen had placed there are back. And the painted glass window depicting charity is in place, lovingly recreated after it was destroyed by a bomb in 1940. Opening up the Soen now moved into its most ambitious phase restoring John Soane's private apartments on the second floor. At the front was the model room, filled with architectural models and dominated by a huge model stand in the centre. Behind the model room was a complex series of carefully designed small spaces, including the bedroom and the bathroom. But in the years since Soane's death, all the partitions that divided these rooms had been removed, most of the contents and objects either put elsewhere in the museum or lost altogether, and the floor was now used as office space, with no access for the public. Opening up the zone planned to restore all the partitions and windows and to put back the whole second floor exactly as it had been at the time of Soane's death. One key resource was the watercolours that Soen had commissioned of all the rooms. These watercolours were really at the core of the research we did to prepare for opening up the Soen. And actually, they were the inspiration for deciding that the most important thing to do was to remove our offices from the second floor of number 13 and clear that space so that we could recreate Soen's private apartments. By 2013, restoration work was well underway. 
The second floor windows on the back of the museum had been significantly altered, with the removal of some windows and the installation of a new large central window. Restoring these windows to their original configuration was a challenge. So it was quite major structural work. Uh, we basically had to reform that area of the wall uh, around a former opening, which was really quite large. Um, so it was done in a series of um, operations by propping that lintel, removing the window, propping that lintel, building up delicate sort of bits of brickwork in vertical columns um, and it was a very complex operation to, to do that while maintaining the stability of the structure above. We were most worried about the third floor collapsing because Wild had used timber, timber was quite close to the external brick ele elevation, uh, there's always a risk that the timber has become decayed or is weakened due to rot or defect. Um, and any defects in that timber would, would again lead to movement which could cause structural failure in, in locations. So it was quite a nervy operation. Also the museum originally wanted to continue using the third floor for their offices while we carried out the work, but luckily we made them see sense and vacated them during that process. All the internal partitions that formed the different spaces had to be manufactured and installed. The next puzzle was what decorative finish to use on the woodwork. The new panels and doors are made of either tulip wood or Iroko, but are painted to look like mahogany, using a special technique that Soman employed called graining. The first stage of graining is called flogging where a thin solution of stain is worked into the pores of the timber. For the next coat, the decorators used traditional methods, mixing powder pigment with Newcastle brown ale or vinegar. This coat is applied to the prepared surface, and then comes the crucial stage of figuring, which mimics the texture and pattern of actual mahogany. By a stroke of good fortune, the museum could provide the decorators with a precise template for the pattern of graining that Soen's own decorators had used, even though all the grain timber doors and partitions had been ripped out or painted over after his death because, miraculously, one door had survived, tucked away downstairs on a cupboard for nearly 200 years. But first, the museum had to confirm that it really did have the original graining. This is quite a remarkable door, and it provided important evidence for the appearance of the graining during John Soane's occupancy of this floor. So I was asked, to take some samples just to establish that this was in fact the original graining. So I took a small sample of the wood with some of the paint attached, mounted in cross section and examined it under the microscope and I could see that there were cells of the wood and there was only one grain decoration on the surface of the wood. So that just confirmed um, that this is a remarkable survival and what we're actually looking at is the graining of the wood that was commissioned by Johnson. And if you look closely, you can sort of see the quite lively swirling of the, uh, of the combing there and this very vibrant design. So when Hare and Humphreys were asked to recreate the graining on this floor, they could use this door as a sort of source archive uh, to be inspired to get the, the vibrancy of the original graining. So it's a very remarkable survival of the Johnson era, um, nearly 200 years old, so we really should treasure this surface. A highlight of the restoration of the second floor was the discovery of how Soen had decorated the walls of the private apartments. By the late 20th century, 
All the walls had been redecorated several times, and it seemed that no trace was left of Soane's original decoration. However, the watercolours of the private apartments clearly show a patterned wallpaper. Our archive described the wallpaper that Soane had bought. We found in the v &A archive the order books of the wallpaper company that Soane ordered the wallpaper from, with a tantalising little strip of coloured wallpaper but no representation of the whole pattern or anything. In 2009, it occurred to us, since we knew that there had been wallpaper in this room, that it might be sensible to do some exploratory cleaning, just to see if possibly there could be the remotest chance of us finding any or anything of it. We asked Mark Sandiford to come here and have a look at each wall in the whole of the second floor and see if he could find anything. And after two hours, back came our historic wallpaper consultant to say, it's all there, I think you've got a whole wall of it. This was perhaps the most remarkable discovery in the whole early part of the contract. It's an extraordinary moment when somebody comes into your office and tells you that something you thought you could never see in reality is actually there. By 2012, work was well underway to strip off the later layers of paint and paper. What we're doing here is uncovering a very rare find in the museum, a piece of original sewn decoration. And currently we are taking off all the later layers which have built up since Soane's death in 1837 and getting back to the wallpaper, which then we will repair, conserve and will form part of the new interior. Removing the later layers of paint and wallpaper, whilst not damaging Soane's original paper, is a delicate task. Chemistry is doing its work. This is quite a sharpened, what's called a continental filling knife, and I'm putting no pressure at all. So I'm just sliding it underneath the, the paint that has now become a gel. I'm putting no pressure at all, it's just the weight of the scraper. It's so delicate and the paper's so finely printed. I don't want to lose any details. Um, I'm as gentle as I can be. It's potentially a very boring job. You know, uh, like a lot of things like this. Uh, but if you don't keep your concentration level pretty high at all times, something will happen and you'll have a mistake and, and you can't go back. That's, that's the the main thing with this. You know, this is the original wallpaper. If you damage it, you can't go back. So one has to have uh, concentration and care at, at all times. You can't take it for granted. This is a, a, a medium to fine wire wool. I'm just agitating these last remnants of paint from within the recesses of the printing, the lower areas of the printing. It sounds extreme using wire wool, but I have tried every other possible. And it's a case of the balance of the cut of the wire wool that cuts through the paint, means you don't have to work it very hard. If I use cotton wool, I have to work it and work it and work it. And the more work you put into the surface, the more damage you will do. It's an extreme sport, really. It has danger at every corner. But if you can balance the technique and the, and the dangerous chemicals, then you get a good result. It wasn't just the bathroom that featured this wallpaper. Detailed research in the archive revealed that it was used throughout the second floor. So, with the specification and quantity now clear, the Soan could go ahead and commission the new wallpaper. They turn to the once fashionable spa town of Sharon Springs, 3,000 miles away in New York State. Here, Adelphi paper hangings specialize in recreating historic wallpaper.
Traditionally, uh, wallpaper rolls were made of individual sheets of paper that were glued together. Uh, they, at that point, they didn't have continuous paper, although the technology for continuous paper was being developed about, about this time, but manufacturers, wallpaper manufacturers were rather reluctant to use, use continuous paper. So um, they glued sheets together. Can't move while I'm drying, so we tape it. The sound provided a photograph of the original wallpaper, from which Michelle at Adelphi had to copy each element of the pattern. She could have done much of this by computer. A lot of people would think that we might use a computer and just draw one and then uh, cut and paste, but we feel like in order to get it exactly like the originals, which were hand hand carved, that we if we draw each one by hand, there'll be the tiniest amount of variation, which will be in keeping with um, with the original more than than by cutting and pasting. The sewn wallpaper pattern has three different colours, so Michelle has to draw a different design for each colour. So once we have all the patterns drawn, we do a little test to see, that, make sure that they all line up with each other. And this is the, this will be the second block, which is the dark orange colour. Put the third one on which is the light yellowish cream color. And that's that. The three transparencies will be used as templates to carve the printing blocks from hardwood. A subcontractor uses a laser to ensure that every detail is clearly cut. Adelphi's basement stores a collection of hundreds of blocks. However careful the laser cutting has been, blocks can need cleaning and repairing before they can be used for printing. The really small elements of the blocks are quite fragile and it's really easy to break them off when you're cleaning the block, so especially these little pin dots, but they're quite easy to repair. You usually just use a nail. And then flatten it to the surface so it's all even. The next stage is to mix the paint. I'm going to make a small batch of the ground paint for the sewn diaper pattern. Uh, it uses three pigments, the three pigments that we use most here. Uh, iron red is the first one, and we'll take, measure out 56 grams of that. Okay, 56. It's a little bit too much, so I'll take a little bit out. Take a little more out. There we go. Uh, the next pigment is yellow ochre, uh, yellow iron oxide. This is the one that we use. It's on in almost all of our paints. And we'll take uh, 46 grams of this one. And the last one is carbon black. Uh, the recipe calls for 0.7 grams. I'm going to use 0.6 because it's always too easy to put too much black into something. You can always add more if you need to. And it seems as though once you get too much black in there, you might as well just start over again. And now we'll mix just a small amount of the paint base into the pigments and get those stirred in well. And then test and see if it matches your standard. Now these paints always dry either lighter or darker than when they're wet. 
but this is the this is the color here that I'm going for. So at the moment, um, it looks rather looks rather different. But let's see what happens. It's much closer now that it's dry. I think it still needs that black. The final base color is applied to the glued paper strips. The paper is hung up to dry and then it'll be ready for the first block printing. Okay, now I'm just going to brush the print paint out and trying to get it evenly coated. It takes a fair amount of paint to charge the felt and then once it's, once it's loaded with paint then you only need to add a little bit each time. Even it out and tamp the block, rocking it back and forth, left to right, front to back. Laying it flat and bringing it over the bridge. Okay. That looks okay. So I'm getting set up to print the second color and the second block. Move the block around a little bit to try to get all the corners. I'm going to line it up with the pins from the first block. Lift it up. And everything looked good on that. I adjusted my registration a little bit. The, the second and particularly the third block were very fine detail. And so to get those so that they, again, match the original when having the, the blocks made and then in printing, we had to be uh, extra careful to, to get the, the detail crisp and, and very fine. The project was, uh, it, was it was good, it was fun. We learned, we learned a lot, uh, which is something that always keeps this uh, rather interesting. Once the completed paper was delivered, it could be hung throughout the second floor. It's a triumph for the museum. A rare example of original early 19th century wallpaper uncovered through a hunch and sitting alongside new wallpaper recreated using traditional techniques. With the wallpaper and wood graining resolved, the next challenge was to uncover the other original colours. When I was asked to establish what the original decoration was, I made a, a sampling plan and I took paint samples from most of the elements, the original walls, the lining of the alcoves, uh, little bits of the wood on the architraves and the panellings below. And I do that by taking a small section of the, the plaster with the paint layers attached, the wood with the paint layers attached, uh, and then I mount those in cross-section and that enables me to look at them quite carefully under a microscope at very high magnifications of up to 50 to times 500. Uh, and this allows me to see all the different layers that have been applied, not, not only by John Soane, but by the people who came after him. And we were surprised to find that when the lodge had been enclosed, um, John Soane had applied this very vivid red colour. And this is composed of a thick red opaque layer covered with a translucent varnish that was tinted with a red pigment. And it's this subtle combination that gives us this lustrous paint effect. And of course, with hindsight now, we can stand back and we can see the red stained glass 
And we now know that John Stone was creating a very integrated, very vibrant scheme. So now we've recreated the red scheme, uh, we installed the, uh, the paintings, we can sort of see that this is how the lodger would have appeared in 1837 when John Stone died. One of the most remarkable aspects of restoring the second floor is the bathroom. In 1820, John Soane installed a plumbed-in bath in the dressing room next to his bedroom. It can be seen under the window in this watercolour. In 1820, it would have been incredibly rare to have a plumbed-in warm bath of this kind in a domestic dwelling house. Um, it was unusual to have a bathroom outside royal palaces. Um, we know the Duke of Wellington had one at Apsley House, but that's about the only other example from this time that we've been able to identify. It was quite extraordinary. And so not only had a bath for himself, but supplied a bath for his servants in the basement. Perhaps as a totally self-made man, the son of a bricklayer, he was very conscious of how much that kind of facility could transform people's lives. By the 1920s, the bath had been completely removed. But today, the original lid covers a precise replica of that bath. Inevitably, there were many clues about the bath in the archive, such as in John Soane's own leather-bound measuring book. You come to a page on which the title Bath appears about halfway down. And then you come to a detailed list of measurements for all the different timber elements used in the making of the, the framing to Soane's bath. Uh, and the first item, for example, just says one and a half deal framing in one panel turned and flush front. Some detailed builders' records from 1918 revealed when the bath was removed. Here, in the day work records for the period February the 2nd to February the 8th, is a little entry, repairing floor and making good after removal of bath. When we started to do the research for the second floor, we discovered all sorts of clues. And what was particularly exciting, clues to physical survivals here, on this north side of what was then my office, the deputy director's office. And it was a most unpromising corner. Um, there was a bookcase covered in all my books and papers, and the walls were covered with uh, yellow anaglypta type wallpaper. It was in the curator's diary that Helen struck gold, when she turned to the same date that the builders had removed the bath. On this particular page, I found something absolutely crucial. Wednesday, February 6th, 1918. Old bath front refixed as dado on north wall. How extraordinary that Arthur Bolton should have thought to record what such a, a small and perhaps mundane seeming piece of work. But thank goodness he did, because um, when I read this entry, I thought, right, well, that's behind the bookcase in my office. So I got help and we pulled out the bookcase, um, dust flying everywhere, and Eureka. Uh, there on the wall was clearly the front of Soane's bath. But uh, once our architects had rushed in in great excitement and started to look at it, we discovered that the woodwork fixed to the wall wasn't just the front of the bath, but also the end of the bath. And that is this end here. And that was a, a really, really vital discovery because the top of the end of the bath was scribed so that the curve of the end of the um, original bath itself could rest properly on that piece of wood. And that gave us the exact shape and front to back width, depth, dimension for the bath itself. To make a new bath, the Soan reached deep into the Brecon Beacons in Wales. 
It's been to here that palaces, cathedrals and many other magnificent institutions have turned to have ambitious and beautiful wrought iron gates, doors, towers and other designs made. Paul Dennis's family have worked metal for generations. I was always very good with my hands. That was the one skill I had. And metal work had been in our family for hundreds of years. It went back to my grandfather, great-grandfather, father. My father taught me. He'd been originally started off as a farrier. My grandfather had built up a big wire works. They concentrated on all sorts of things in metal. They made everything right down to most traps, funnily enough. I love the physicalness of it. I love the creation of it. It's, it's actually creating something from a solid lump of metal and you can turn it into anything you want. You put it in the fire and it becomes malleable like plasticine and you can make it anything. And then suddenly this thing starts growing, which is really, because you're making it individual, it's the only thing in the world like it. It might look like other things, but it's totally different. It's your own and it's got your own touch on it and it works a bit like handwriting. Two people never make the same thing, exactly. And, uh, and that's what it is, and, and I've never lost that passion for it in all the years I've been doing it, and I've been doing it over 50 years now. Soane's original bath was made of wrought iron, but this material is no longer available in the right quality. So the new bath was made of modern steel, but where possible, using traditional techniques. The bath was quite thick, and in, it, it was very difficult to work well like that, that's quite good. And uh, well, I did try it as much as I could to keep as traditional as I could on it, although we couldn't do it absolutely often, they were soldered together and things like that. And I just had to make it so that it looked exactly as if it had been made in, I think it might have been what year period, it was 1810, 1820. And that was it, it wasn't the most comfortable bath of mine, you wouldn't want to sit in it, it was flat bottom <laughs> and sort of rigid sides, but I suppose it would, it would work, it would certainly be better not take in a bath at all. And I was very pleased with it, and, uh, and it went away. I thought, oh, that, that looks all right. We knew from the bill again that the bath was japanned white inside. And we commissioned Titian Studios in West London to uh, receive the stainless steel bath and japan it in an entirely traditional way. And again, we had very interesting discussions with them and in the end concluded that we should simply use um, linseed, linseed oil and earth pigments. And that pr uh, provided a very natural white without any need to antique it or make it look old in any way at all. Okay, one second. Bring it a little bit forward. Okay, we are ready to go now. Yeah? Ready to go? One, two, two Mind three. Find your finger there. Yeah, I've got my fingers free. With the bath now complete, work started on restoring the original front and side panels. I've been using a weak ammonia based chemical in a gel form to clean the dirt out of the varnish. We apply the gel to the surface that needs cleaning and leave it for a minute or so. We then remove it with cotton swabs and saliva. And that might sound quite disgusting, but actually saliva is very useful in cleaning because it's much more controllable. With water it can become too wet and it also has the added benefit of having enzymes in it which continue the cleaning process and the archive provided a clue about another original piece of the bath. I also found a reference to the lid of the bath being kept and used as a table and I thought, well, where could that be? I wonder if it's amongst all the miscellaneous bits of mahogany in the front cellars. And sure enough, when we went through everything, we found the lid. 
and it still bears the scars of its use as a table because the underside is covered with cut marks, which we very carefully kept during the restoration. The original bill for Soane's bath gave, gave us definite evidence that it had been plumbed in and that the hot water for the bath came from a copper which was upstairs on the floor above. Once we'd uncovered um, all the remnants of Soane's original wallpaper, we discovered that in this corner there was a very pronounced vertical line um, where there was no paper. And we came to the conclusion that that was where the lead pipe must have run down from the copper into the wash stand here and then from there somehow fed the hot water into the bath. And what we did find was uh, the cutout in the floorboards where the pipework uh, had a D-trap in it and in the back wall evidence that the, that the bath just discharged through a pipe down over the rear roofs of the museum, which is quite an extraordinary thought when you think of modern plumbing regulations. I think for us, recreating Soane's bath was one of the most special and um, exciting elements of the whole project because we started with nothing, just a bill and a space in the corner of a room. And we ended up with something that I think is, is incredibly convincing. It's a wonderful mixture of brilliant new cabinet making with the surviving lid and front and end and the new bath so beautifully made by Paul Dennis and I think it's a triumph. You've got the base job. In the next episode, we'll see the restoration of a priceless 200-year-old plaster model. 200 years, the first time this has been seen. Amazing. The complex process of recreating one of Soane's picture frames and the delicate work of gilding it. Thank you.